Hello, ladies. I'm so happy to be back. I always intend to come back in here. This is my guest room, which is probably the least messed up room in the house. And uh, there's, it's like a studio because everything remains the same. And so I'm in here. I brought you in here in the past for uh, another video previously. And I would like to say thanks for coming. And if you're new, I'm Mrs. Sherman. And I do not put, I do not have comments on the video because I'd like you to go on over to my blog, uh, for which I'll post the link and participate in the conversation over there. Leave me a comment, please. I can't handle more than one thing on the media at a time, and I've chosen to make these videos for my blog, and YouTube is just a parking place for them and a host. So, ladies, I'm so happy to be here and happy to see you, and I'd like to say that this is for, these videos are created for you to listen to as you go. Sometimes you're in the car, I'll be reading something and it's nice to listen to something. Sometimes you're, you've got things you need to do and where you need your eyes and your hands. And I love the videos on homemaking and crafting, but I have to stop and watch them. And I like live stream too, but I would have to be peering always at the comment and it, my message wouldn't, there wouldn't be time for the entire message, so I decided not to do that. And comments on my blog are so welcome and they stimulate my ideas, and so please send them. And I'm going to use some of the ideas and suggestions you've given me today. Now, the first thing, I have three things that I cover, and it hasn't changed yet. It kind of developed since I started. And the first thing we're going to discuss is preparation for your work, which consists of appearance and uh, maybe your your mental and spiritual outlook. And the second thing will be the actual homemaking and what you do for homemaking. It's not all work, you know. And then the third thing is uh, developing your, um, your way with people because you're going to have children around and your husband and maybe other people. And uh, it's rather amusing how popular that section is. In fact, some people tell me they fast forward to the section on people because... They find it more entertaining. It's it's kind of sad, isn't it? We we have people that uh, uh, aren't always so nice and will say things. And this part will be designed to keep you from being uh, triggered by it and to realize that it has been going on since the beginning of time. I can guarantee you, I'm from the olden days, the 1950s, and I can guarantee you the comments are not particularly, the comments about homemakers are not particularly um, uh, creative because they just, once a person gets into believing something that is an error, they pretty much fall into the same script as been going on from the beginning of time and the same comments and the same remarks about homemakers and towards them. It's funny, isn't it? Like they all went to the same school. <laughs> so today, I'd like you to use this video as a uh, listen as you go around your house and do something repetitive that you, I hope you've saved up something to do. I know if I broadcast for about 20 minutes, I could get a bed made or I could get uh, a room, a complete room, you know, tidied up and maybe have left time, time left over. And so if you've got something you need to do, you could probably, if I speak for an hour, get a room done, get some things done in the kitchen, unload your dishwasher or load it and uh, fold some things, check your laundry, maybe do some outdoor work. And so today I want to encourage you that if you've got something you need to do, please don't sit here and watch me. There isn't anything going on. I'm not going to show you how to do anything. I don't have the, um, I'm not set up, you know, to do a video of what I'm doing. And I didn't want to take anybody's time up because we don't really have, as homemakers, we don't really have time to sit and watch someone else do housework um, unless we're resting. And so I want to use this as a listen as you go. And I want to also say, please, if this isn't suitable for you and it's objectionable to you and you're upset by it, please go somewhere else. There probably is something in this great big world wide web for you that suits you better. And so I want to start out by sharing my teacup with you. 
today it I have shown this before but this one particularly goes with my with my sweater which is one of those time and true brands that come came from Walmart a couple years ago as well as the necklace and the uh, it has little gold sparkles in it I do yes I would wear this at home with an apron over it of course if I wanted to if I just wanted to dress up a little bit and feel a little more festive and was not planning on going anywhere in fact this morning I had this on and was getting ready for this video and uh, the post uh, the Postal Service came to the door and wanted me to sign something so I was sort of glad that I was dressed up and she asked me are you going somewhere or are you know are you having a party and I said no <laughs> just this is just what I do I have clothes hanging in my closet that won't get worn to a fancy dress ball or anything like that so I put them on once in a while and they're a lot of fun if I'm not going to be doing anything to that would uh, damage the clothing I wear them and so today I'm going to show you my teacup it has gold edging and it's to go with my sweater and it is from Royal Albert and I got this one at a thrift store it has somebody's initial on the bottom looked like it was inherited or was taken to a uh, an event and their initial was on the bottom to show that it was theirs and so this has this is a Royal Albert there's no other name on it I looks like it's a little older than the 1960s but it might not be most of our teacups I found out are from the 1960s but because people stopped their formal teas around the 1960s it's been revived since in the 1980s a lot of these were in really good shape they didn't use them and even in the 1950s when I was growing up a lot of these were put on the shelf and just looked at so I don't have any teacups in my cabinet that I cannot use I, I have discovered something you might find valuable about teacups when I go to home goods or to uh, Goodwill and there are teacups that are all the same all matching I only get one uh, because I will tell you something that I discovered unless I'm setting a formal table and they all have to match I really only need one of everything that I see not four of them just because there are four of them at Goodwill at, at home goods doesn't mean that I'm going to get all four and I told you about home goods it has salvage which is new new products that uh, they buy from other stores when they're changing their inventory and what I do is buy one because I have noticed when I have a, a buffet tea for people they will carry their go get their tea carry their cup around and that way if they set their cup down they know which one is theirs because they're not all the same they will say oh I've got the one with the white one with the gold on it or I've got the one with the uh, with the rose on it and so that's why and that way there's more room in my cabinet and I don't have uh, huge sets of things and the lady that sent me the lady that will not tell me who she is that sent me the set of six was just brilliant because each one of those is a different color and I have used them in the ladies Bible class and I noticed they all go and enjoy picking out their favorite color and then they know if they go sit somewhere else and they've set their teacup down they know which one is theirs so I'm going to read to you a little bit today and somebody suggested I I make a list or show some of the coffee table books I've had over the years and this one is just precious now I homeschooled my children and so I looked it was before curriculum was widely available so I looked around for things that would help us life live you know enjoy life and learn about life and learning about living in the home especially and this was called listen to the quiet and it's by Alda Ellis I'll try to remember to post a picture of it so you can go get one at thrift books a books or some of these other places and one of the things I like about thrift books is most of the time you don't even have to pay postage that's a lot better for me and so that's why I use thrift books uh, and you know I can't resist a book but uh, of course I'm going through my books now and this was one of the ones I came across and um, so it's called listen to the quiet and I wanted to show you the beautiful um, paintings that were in it now that's possibly why I bought it uh, it was in a gift shop at the time and it, it was printed in 2002 and I want I'm just flipping through here right now to show you some of the the lady who who wrote it was a watercolor artist and she also put some of her own art in it which which I found absolutely 
gorgeous. And there's another paint. Some of these are famous paintings, prints of them. And so I'm going to try to read this to you and then show you something else that it had that I enjoyed doing this morning. Uh, if I can find it. So, uh, goodness. Um, okay, I found it. All right, thanks for your patience. Listen to the solitude. So let me just read the table of contents. Okay, listen to the quiet. Listen to the solitude, listen to the creativity, listen to pampering, listen to your surroundings. This was, this was great for my growing children and listen to something new. And this was great for my children because it taught them how to view the day and view the world and view your life and notice things. And so it was just uh, to educate the senses was important to me. My mother did it and her mother before her would point out things in nature and to enrich, enrich their lives and give them a feeling of happiness to be here. So uh, the first part of this book is called Listen to the Solitude. I love to uh, observe, um, she said, I love my favorite way, oh, here it is. Let's start from the beginning here. Listen to the quiet, <laughs> all right. In the midst of our busy day-to-day -day schedules, it is so easy to get caught up in the world's hectic pace. We're told that our lives today are much better because of the high-speed, high-tech convenience of modern inventions and the like. Uh, yet with the life moving at such a rapid pace, is any wonder we feel scattered and stressed. In a world where being called an overachiever or a perfectionist is considered a compliment, we sometimes feel guilty if we cannot take a moment for if we do take a moment for ourselves. But should we feel this way? It is with great comfort that I turn to the pages of the Bible for that answer. And all through this little book, she has scriptures done in a beautiful script, beautiful font, and um, and they're just so appropriate for what she's writing about. There, I am given an example of what to do when I find myself overwhelmed by life. I read about Jesus going up to the mountains to pray all by himself. His spring could flow out and pour blessings onto those around him. Likewise, when we are healthy and happy on the inside, it radiates outward to our families, to our friends, and to the world around us. And you know, Christ also went away to a place by himself. And this is so important for you to renew yourself. And I did mention a queen that had said if she did not have her holiday home where they went, and had no schedule, no attention, no press, nothing, and became people that could just relax and be quiet and be themselves. She said, if we didn't have that, we didn't have that escape, we, you wouldn't have us. You wouldn't have us in the service that we do for our country. This book is a gentle celebration of the art of renewing our souls as we learn to unwind and find peace and comfort without a note of guilt. I hope you'll be inspired to find your own favorite ways to take time for yourself and savor the rewards of the quiet. And I had taught my children to do this, and I hope they still do this, not to forget. And I think one of the reasons sometimes when we, as homemakers, get up in the morning and kind of feel like we don't know where to start is because we don't start here. We don't start with the quiet. So let me move on here to a daily dose of solitude. Somehow, I think I had something else I wanted to read to you, but and I didn't mark it, unfortunately. And uh, Like getting plenty of water and exercise, building solitude into your day is also good for you. Have you ever thought of that list that you're going to make? You know, drink water, go for a walk, um, have a devotional, read the Bible of including a dose of solitude. Choose one of these to engage in each day and make a special appointment with yourself to listen to the solitude. 
and here are some favorite ways to reward yourself with a daily dose of solitude you know you can actually live in luxury in your home by creating these moments of solitude they're wonderful as a matter of fact one of the houses that we lived in out on a ranch was built i believe in the 1940s and we noticed that the windows were placed so that in, at certain times during the day the light or the sun would come in and if that was where a chair was placed then the lady of the home could sit there and read or do her needlework or her mending in the evening in the quiet of the evening after the chores had been done during the day and everything was thought of where to put a window where to put a corner where to you know where was the door it was all thought of out carefully because people were familiar with uh, a day at home and living at home and that's how they uh, that's how they arranged their houses and so here are here's the list of solitude things that you could include in your daily schedule read a daily devotional write in a journal play or listen to music read a classic book spend time in prayer take a morning or evening walk now I'll explain to you from this book Jane Austen the Jane Austen diet on the section on exercise that they often just went for walks just because it was for health and to breathe and to observe what was around them and what was very important uh, nature this is the beauty of it it wasn't they didn't uh, dress up in running clothes and and uh, try to wear themselves out with exercise they went for walks because of because of other reasons and listen to uh, write a letter to a friend list listen to the sound of the outdoors that is something you can do with your children ask them what they hear outdoors and then tell them what what they could listen for sketching or painting and I'll never forget going for a walk on the beach and a couple of summers ago we were walking up kind of above on a pathway that was above the beach and there were some rocky areas there and I saw a lady sitting in between a few rocks on a some sand and she had her little paint box out and she was painting and that is just so sweet and it's also lovely to look at people doing things like that and enjoying a cup of tea which I highly recommend by the way so I have something else that I want to read to you about that's in this book and it's called the home spa treatment now these I think are the paintings that she does her she did herself this book is quite uh, well you know 2002 was when it was print first printed and this is called a home spa treatment and I think you can do this the ingredients you need are one washcloth and fresh herbal sprigs now I have outside in my garden even in winter that grows quite well parsley sage rosemary thyme and uh, mint so I took all those sprigs and here's what it says to do wet your washcloth with hot water place a sprig of rosemary chamomile or lavender in the center fold over the washcloth and wring out any excess water to release the herbal fragrance into the steam of the washcloth lay the washcloth over your face and breathe in deeply enjoy until the cloth cools as a summer treat I keep a mini bouquet of rosemary in a crystal bud vase by my bathroom sink so it's handy every morning isn't that nice so and there are many other things in here about that so this again this is called listen to the quiet by Alda Ellis I thought you would enjoy that it just gives you a feeling of luxury and home life should not be grueling you should not be up constantly upset and driving the place like you are a drill sergeant um, there should it should be have it should have an atmosphere and you should have an atmosphere of being the quiet lady of the house but who has an aura of elegance about what she does and does it with great happiness so the first thing that we do in in this video if you haven't done it yet is to prepare yourself get your hair fixed put on a little perfume if you don't have nice clothes you know these days you can go to Goodwill and, and Walmart and you don't have to pay a lot and you can have something fairly nice and uh, sometimes unfortunately they last forever <laughs> and so you end up with a collection but uh, there it's nice to change and so uh, I think that you like your home better when you're dressed up and so to 
to take care of yourself. If you don't have anything that you feel is nice to wear, at least fix your hair and fix your skin. Put on a little perfume, put some shoes on, and feel as though you're a in a very important position, which you are. And in a way, you know, the Bible talks about uh, the star, you know, the stars. And it says the righteous shall shine like the stars. And when you think of it, you're a star because you're home. You're living, you're trying to live the Titus II role of guarding and guiding the home and being kind to your children and your husband. And this is such a beautiful way to live. And I know that a lot of people don't think they can do this, but I'll guarantee you, if you wait until you think that uh, the world is going to straighten out, a lot of people don't think they can live their life happily until the world, world straightens out, until things get better in the world. And that's a big mistake because you can wait a lifetime for that. It will never happen. In the meantime, your children will grow up and you will have lost all that time at home. So if you think about how uh, in my previous video where I talked about how something is either a commitment or a preference, think about that and see how much, uh, how much you really believe that you should be home or you can be home. Now, for those of you that aren't home yet, you can still stay, you can still, I've often said, just start where you are at in your life and start making your home a better place or a more desirable place. And pretty soon you won't want to go somewhere else. You'll want to be there because of the new treat that you have created for yourself in your home uh, spa or your, or your home. And so um, one of the reasons to dress up, of course, is because you'll like yourself better and you know, if you like yourself, you're more likely to treat everyone else with respect. And it's a way of showing respect to people around you and to yourself and to the Lord for giving you life and for giving you the ability to get up and get dressed. And so it also gives a good reputation to homemaking. Now, I'll have to stop here a minute and tell you a story that just happened to me last night. I had to make a quick trip to a little grocery store that we have here and as I was standing in line uh, waiting for the uh, for my turn the cashier who had just uh, finished taking care of the previous customer said to me oh my life is so frazzled she said I I just sometimes think you know it's just so frazzled and and um, and she said, uh, I sometimes think it would be better to be in the 1950s. And I looked at her and said, you know, I'm from the 1950s. And this is better. Believe me, it's better. Now, a lot of people, it's, it's like when um, something, uh, there's an era that's passed. Everyone only sees the good things, of course. And they don't know or remember the discomforts that there, that there were. And I could tell you stories about how inconvenient and uncomfortable life could be in those days. But as we got more into um, more efficiency, life just became a little bit more comfortable. And I'm, I'm just talking about just the, the idea of the home and the comforts we have at home. And I told her that it wasn't so much the physical things, but the fact that the women didn't feel it was necessary to leave their homes and run here and run there. And I know this woman said that after work she had to go do this and this and this and this, and she hardly has any time at home. She didn't look well rested. And I said we didn't feel the obligation to work outside the home, and our husbands were very, very proud to say that their wife was home and didn't have to work. In fact, they would be embarrassed if their wife got a job. And that is hard for some of you kids to understand, but that was the mentality of the time that a woman only worked if her husband died or if her husband was no good. <laughs> what that meant were many different things. Well, today it's so different that it's hard for them to understand. And uh, I don't know why she was complaining to me at the time, but maybe I look like 1950s or something. But anyway, um, I, it's, it's hard to give people, I, I try not to give people any kind of um, advice unless I have uh, an alternative to give them. So it's hard, I, for instance, I wouldn't walk up to someone who uh, was dressed a certain way and say something unless I knew where they could get something better. And so... 
So dressing up gives a good reputation to your home and to the to the word homemaker. And I would also say that now that we're in, I'm in the section on homemaking, I would say for some of you who don't have, uh, you look at my backgrounds and you see all this decor, well, uh, a lot of it, you know, can come quite easily from our Goodwills, dollar stores, and Walmarts with, with just for just pennies, really, a lot of the time. And if you don't have all this, let me tell you what you can do to make your home a beautiful and better place. Just clean it. Just clean everything. And you will find that it brings you greater contentment and it sparkles. Everything is just lovely. You get more ideas while you're cleaning. Now, on the door there behind me, several people in the, one of the last videos in this room made the remark about that painting there. That was back in the olden days when they had the, the little sponges that were shaped like roses. And it was in a little paint kit. And you, you took the sponges out and you dipped them in paint and you you painted a picture with them they didn't actually work very well so i didn't keep them for very i used them a few times but that's been on that door since 1992 i think we have to paint around it when we're trying to repaint the door but i mean it, it wasn't the best and the ribbon and everything came with uh in these stamps in these uh, sponge stamps they didn't they didn't actually work very well it took a lot of extra time and patience to fix them once they were stamped on and so I wanted to tell you about that some of you might still have some of those I wasn't too impressed so I didn't keep them um, pass them on to someone else so now I've been talking for about 26 minutes and I hope you're not watching me and I hope that you got something done um, maybe you are doing your exercises maybe you're making your list or maybe you are cleaning something. Uh, last night, I had kind of a big job. My kitchen had just gotten out of control, piles of stuff everywhere because I had had a ladies' Bible class in my home. And then we had, uh, directly after the class, had some running around that we needed to do while the shops were open and while it was daylight. And so I had to leave it. So I had to go. And when I came home, consequently, then we ate dinner and then it got worse. So I put on a favorite movie, which I don't watch. I just listen to and picked up some extra sayings that were a lot of fun. And I will tell you about one of them as I go through this. So today I want to talk about um, some things regarding uh, oh, about your housework. Now, one of the problems uh, you'll hear people say, I don't... Uh, I decided not to become a housewife because it, I don't want to get bored. Look, you don't have to be bored. And in any job outside the home, there will be boring moments. And you can't help it because that's the way it is. But at home, you can. You don't have to be bored. And one of the ways to avoid boredom is to don't get stuck. Don't get stuck with the same uh, the same way of doing things. For example, change your clothes. Wear something bright and beautiful. Don't wear that same shirt all week long. I know that it's economical and you don't have to wash it if you just wear it over your t-shirt all week. But if you are noticing that your mood is becoming more despondent or down, do change your clothes. And someone suggested to me that you could also change the route that you take when you go into your town so that when you come home you see something different and you're more alert you don't kind of uh, check out mentally so because i think one of the things that causes boredom is sameness now some sameness is very good for example i have a cup of tea every morning but i use a different cup and this might seem rather trivial to some of you who really aren't too experienced in having a lovely home or who just don't understand home life, I would suggest you stay home for three days and don't go anywhere. And I mean, first, you know, get some things in the house from the grocery store and so you can survive for three days. Stay home for three days and see how it goes. You will find after the third day that you start to get more resourceful about things that need to be done. And so don't get stuck in a, in bad habits and don't get stuck in your house you know you can change uh, the cover on your furniture you can change the cover on your bed you can uh, 
used to be you couldn't find anything and everything was so expensive but in this day and age you can get things blank blankets are very inexpensive and you can change the colors on your furniture you can change your furniture around and you can try new recipes there there is so much that you can do that it's almost there just isn't enough time so now I've talked for 30 minutes so the next 30 minutes is the one that everyone seems to be so interested in and I don't want to give the impression that being a homemaker is just going to invite trouble and criticism but we might as well face it it's been that way since the beginning of time and uh, in fact the Bible warns about people who would go into the homes of women and uh, gossip and you know waste their time I don't think a lot of people re remember that that was actually the point that this these people were captivating the minds of women um, by their by their idleness just just going from house to house and and talking about different things and sometimes this can happen with you with someone comes in and they seem to be rather uh, critical of you and I would like to give you some ideas of how you can handle this first of all uh, remember Colossians 4 um, I wanted to talk about Colossians 4 because we had a ladies Bible class and we read that chapter everyone took a turn reading a few verses and then they were allowed to talk about we're all allowed to talk about uh, what the meaning could be and why um, to how you could apply it to yourself today and one of the verses said to behave wisely it may, let your conversation be wise around people who are without who are outside of your group outside of the church so I would like to um, extend that further be careful what you say to other people about your inner workings of your home if you're in a church you don't go around and talk to people who aren't even believers and tell them about what you didn't like about the sermon or the Bible class or um, something that you didn't like about the church building you, 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 you remain quiet about that because first of all you don't want to discourage them from uh, obeying the gospel but second of all you want to give Christ and the brethren a good reputation and so this let's extend this into the home be careful what you say to other people and first of all let's start with your country for example now in America now of course I explained to you in a previous video that it isn't America it isn't Washington DC every state has its own personality every state has its own accent every state has its own flag it has its own White House which is the governor's mansion it has its own governor which is the president it has its own Secretary of State we elect all these people it has its own Senate with a House of Representatives and a Senate I mean Congress with its with a House of Representatives and a Senate and we elect all those in each state it has its own um, just about everything to survive as a, a country a separate country and yet people don't really know what goes on in these states because all they hear from the news media is what happens in Washington DC but what happens in Washington DC to people in their state matters not to them at all because they are extremely loyal to their own state for instance especially in Texas which is a wonderful place I used to live there myself but I was so impressed because they love their state and they treat it like a country and indeed it is like a country they have their own businesses they have their own brand and they could survive without the central government and without help from the central government so we're all loosely joined together into one United States and we have our own um, we have our own flag we have our own uh, constitution too every state has a constitution how much do you know about this well probably nothing because well you've got your eyes focused on the central government which uh, which doesn't actually make laws for us each state is more have, have states rights is more important to Americans so we can override the central government it does not control us and the central government is there at the um, at the pleasure of the states the states formed the central government the central government does not form the states so a lot of people have that mixed up especially if you're overseas and you need to have uh, before you mouth off about America and and how awful it is and everything you need to inform yourself a little bit better study a little bit more about each state and about our Constitution of each state and of the, the country 
And um, remember, too, when I'm talking about Colossians 4, where it says, be careful what you say to those who are without your, outside of your, uh, of your beliefs, because if you start, I'll, I'll just relate it to the homemaker, okay? If you start complaining about your country and saying horrible things about the people that you probably elected, um, it's only a few steps away till you start complaining about the church. So you'll start complaining about the leadership of the church, and maybe they are bad, but you know, you can always go somewhere else. We're not limited. We don't have to stay in the same state. We don't have to stay in the same congregation. But the only problem with this kind of attitude is, we call it stinking thinking. <laughs> and that is, and we, we attended a uh, kind of a little business seminar when we were in business once, many years ago, decades ago, and the man that was giving the speech that day was saying that, a lot of people will move around trying to get away from their problems, but they take their head with them. They take themselves with them and the same stinking thinking. And so if you start criticizing your country, now we, uh, back in the 1950s, no one did stuff like that because uh, it was our country and we had elected um, our people, our governors, and uh, and so we were going to be, you know, we cooperated with them. We were kind to them. Now, when they did wrong, we made an appeal. We prayed for them, and we tried to live a peaceful life. There are several. I did do a, a article about that recently. I'll try to find it and put a link to it so you can read the four things you can do for your government. And so, if you start complaining about your country. And then it's not long before you start complaining about the church. And after that comes your family. You'll start telling out of school, telling, telling tales out of school, which is an old saying, um, talking to people you meet in the grocery store and friends on the phone about a rotten family you have, you know. And um, that's not healthy at all. It's not helpful at all. And it's going to tear down the work that you're trying to do for harmony in the home and having harmonious conversations. So it's only a step away before you're starting to talk bad about your family. And we were, uh, when we were growing up, you did not talk about your family in any way that would run them down in front of other people at school or in the public or anything like that. And you had respect for that because the home was so important. And then, you know, you're, your manners flow outward, and from the home comes the church, and from the church comes the country. And so it's very, very important to, uh, I believe that God does not approve of us um, vilifying the country we lived in, because, of course, he gave us our birth, the land of our birth. We live here at, um, at his generosity, and for us to say we hate our country is... To, it flies in the face of God's benevolence towards us. I think that's very important. I love my God, my country, and my family, and that's and my the state I live in. And I think that most Americans feel that way. This is hard to understand if you're overseas and it's a national pastime for you to run down your uh, your royalty, your uh, your prime minister, your president, and that sort of thing. Sometimes it's a national pastime, and people just do it, and they call it freedom of speech. But we don't call it freedom of speech. That's license. That's um, not the same thing as uh, freedom of speech. And freedom of speech does not mean that we can uh, vilify other people. And I think it's very important to respect God and be thankful for the country that we live in. I don't cotton too well to people who want to talk to me about how bad um, America is. I, I don't like that at all because I'm an American. I am America. And that's the way we feel in America. When we're an American, this is our country and it is us. So if you're criticizing our country, you're criticizing us and we won't respond very well. Now, Americans are very um, tolerant people. I, it varies from state to state, but generally they're pretty tolerant. They'll listen to people and kind of shrug it off, but it's a mistake to push them too far because they will eventually tell you to be quiet. <laughs> so um, I am not saying that we don't, I'm not saying that we overlook every little thing that's wrong, but that's our business. You know, you take care of your country and I'll take care of mine. You take care of your state and I'll take care of mine. Okay. So one thing that you need to remember with people that are very, very critical 
is uh, one of the things that they do is they, they don't realize that a conversation that's taking place in your home, let's say you're having a tea or you're having a ladies' class or something, and then a lot of things people say are just, it's just friendly banter. They're just going to say something like, um, we have a lot of hollyhocks in bloom right now, and somebody is going to say, this is where people, and I think it starts when you're really young and then you, you kind of outgrow it, being critical. They'll say, well, those aren't hollyhocks. Those are periwinkles. Don't you know the difference between a hollyhock and a periwinkle? Of course, I live in the country, so I'm just using this as an example. Or you'll say, I had a very nice cup of coffee at such and such a place, and um, and it was only you know so many cents, and they'll say, well, that's not how much it costs. And see, they correct every little thing so that the conversation is not harmonious and fluent. And so what I'd like to say is make sure that you, I'm sure this has happened to you with people, you know, make sure that you don't do it. If you can stop yourself and correct yourself first, sometimes that will take care of itself. You don't have to feel the need to correct every little thing when people are just, they're not seriously saying anything that's wrong. They're just providing friendly conversation. It's just general conversation. You don't have to correct everything in a conversation. It makes, it puts people off and you'll notice when you start doing it, after a while they'll just clamp up, they'll just clamp down. They just won't talk. They're, you can tell they're miserable. They'll look around for an escape. Um, and there are some situations we get in, and I, I think particularly church members need to stop doing it, um, correcting your, correcting their own brethren back and forth till, the, till you just can't even... Some people just want to be friendly. They just want to talk, and you can overlook it. So practice. This is what I would suggest you do. And I would suggest if you're doing this, or if you're if you've got a friend that's doing this, to suggest that they just overlook, practice being quiet and overlooking. You know, the Bible talks about um, it's an honor for a man to overlook a fault. It Practice overlooking some little fault or some little thing that someone said that isn't quite exactly um, too uh, accurate. You know, some people are just fanatics about being accurate about every little thing. But if they'll say, if they say something like, I always enjoy coming to your house and having your Yorkshire gold tea and some other ladies sitting there saying well this isn't Yorkshire gold I know this isn't Yorkshire gold look you could shut up and ignore it and see how it goes just practice this when you are tempted to say something think to think to yourself is it is it um, contradicting is it an objection well it might be true you know you might feel you have an obligation to make everybody exactly so truthful but you don't realize what that does it deadens a conversation and friendship and family and this could be going on in the family you know but these are precious things the family is so precious and the friendships they're so precious is it worth correcting every little thing. Now, if you start that habit, I want you to have a look. If you are correcting your hostess, your just to anybody, maybe someone in the home, uh, constantly, after a while, look and see how their consonants falls, countenance falls, and how it's the beginning of um, maybe a feeling of discouragement. Maybe even you can even uh, set people up for deep depression with constant, constant correction over little, tiny things. And so I have mentioned this before. I don't know why this is a favorite of women, but I will tell you, this has not started just because you became a homemaker in this generation. This has been going on since the beginning of time. You would have heard if you had lived back in the 50s and you had a great grandmother that was born in the early 1900s or late 1800s, she would have been telling you similar things about someone that, that they knew that was always objecting to everything. And I think they had a saying butter wouldn't melt in her mouth or something they always had these sayings that went on where they would identify someone's um, character <laughs> with a little little saying so one thing I want to do too is talk to you about not putting off a future that you want while you wait for the world to come around to your way of thinking. If you want to dress up and you want to wear something sparkly like I am to do, you can do that. You can dress, the children can dress up too. They can dress up in the home if they want to because it puts more dignity in the home. One of the things we do that maybe isn't so good is we make the children live in their play clothes all week 
and then on Sunday they dress up. But once in a while during the week they should be allowed to dress up too. And in the olden days, you know, they used to dress for dinner. So why not get dressed up for dinner? It's it's just wonderful. But once you've allowed them to be dressed up and you're all at the dinner table and everything, don't start losing your temper and yelling in the, at them and constant, um, constant berating because they will say, I got all dressed up for this and all they did... <laughs> Let's yell at me. So have you ever felt like that? Where you got all dressed up and you went to some event, some social event, and someone was rude to you. And it kind of puts you off of getting dressed up after a while because of the way people act. So think about that. And also, if you get someone who is always uh, trying to question you about something, I've had a, a lot of interesting interaction on email over this. And this is this... Uh, idea that people are trying to siphon information out of you, information that they could get just about anywhere else, but it is a way in a way of making you feel invaded, um, assaulted, and demeaned by trying to get information out of you. And it could make you feel ridiculous too, but don't ever, ever reveal too much. Cut off the information. If you say too much, that gives these critics a chance to either contradict you or to uh, take the information and run with it as as Emma said. And so first of all, don't ever say the words, I can't afford it, because that triggers some people. They will start bringing you information about where to find a job or how to make money. And they'll get you so busy in your home making money and uh, you will be a, you won't have the time and the relaxation for your family to give them your all. And the minute you say you can't afford something as an excuse, they start telling you what to do and how you can't afford it. I think it'd be better to say, I'm not interested. Remember I told you that word interesting was such a neutral word? It's also good to say, I'm not interested. And so you don't also, also you don't reveal to anyone your income. They, they seem insatiably curious about your income once you decide to be home. They want to know what your income is. How much does your husband make? How much do you have in the bank? How much do you save? How much did your vacation cost? I will tell you the reason why you should not tell anyone what your income is. And this is the reason. When you start having a hard time, people will start to criticize you. Well, they'll say you shouldn't have bought this or you shouldn't have bought that. And on your income, how can you afford to go here or go there? The other thing is 20 years later, if they know your income and they know your situation, 20 years later, they'll be coming back at you constantly, communicating with you and trying to find new jobs for your husband. And I've heard of people where this has happened, where a man and his wife are happy, they're a bit low income, and they live in a house that isn't uh, high end, but they're happy and they're not uh, they're not doing too badly, really, but someone feels sorry for them and says, why don't you move to a different house? And they will say, well, my husband only makes so much, and this is the one we can afford, and this is the way we can live. And they will always remember how much he made and try to get you to show him different jobs that he could be doing, and they'll send them to, uh, to you and 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 give you all the information and they're, they'll be out looking for a job for your husband so that you can live better. So don't ever tell anyone uh, how much your husband makes, how much you make, how much extra your mother sent you, what, what your inheritance was when your mother died. Don't tell anybody that because they think that you have that and you can do something better with it. And it's better just to say, uh, we're happy, we're fine. But like they used to, you know, we need to get back, back some of our dignity. Whereas we are living in an era where people think if you don't tell all, you must be hiding something. Well, of course, we're we're not hiding things because we're ashamed of it. We're hiding things and we're protecting our privacy because they're personal. It's like why do we why do we cover ourselves up? Because not because we're ashamed of ourselves, but because we are um, hiding our privacy. You see. And that's why we don't show all, tell all, and um, and just reveal everything to everyone. But you'll get these people that will say, um, will want to know how much your husband makes or what your income is. I guarantee if you tell them, 
they will be trying to help you earn more money all the time. They'll find ways that you can that you can earn money and use up your time and it's best not to even let them know. Now some people just have memories like they say memories like elephants and they'll remember you know how much you are paying for your house, how much you paid for it, whether you're still paying for it. You cannot reveal this kind of stuff because if you've paid for your house They'll say, well, now that you've paid for your house, you've got all that extra money. You should be doing this. And so, you know, stick to your sayings. Uh, that's a need to know basis and you don't need to know. And if you've already told, if you've already revealed, you'll notice these people somehow have a connection to you because they know how much you uh, were paying for your house or they know how much you, you, your husband was making and what your income is, how much your mother left you when she died and you need to put a lot of it to rest and you you're allowed to contradict them and you can say um, we don't make uh, what you think we made and besides that it's private you know and so you can uh, make them feel a slightly ashamed without without alienating them completely and one of the things we need to do I know there are people who have said well, why don't you just tell them off because there are some people you have to be careful not to alienate. Maybe they are connected to your husband's business. Maybe they are connected to your family. Maybe they're connected to your church. And they're at different levels of maturity. And over time, they will learn not to behave that way. They will learn not to ask questions. They will learn not to ask how much you make or how much uh, the place that you went you know, for a vacation cost you or how much your parents make, how much money your parents have saved up, what your parents used to do for a living, that kind of thing. It's not wise. They need to mind their own business. And also you can help these people focus on something else, turn their attention to something else. And that's why one of the books that I read from Ethel Cotton's Course in Conversation said, have a wardrobe of things in your mind, things that you can talk to people about to distract them. So you might want to spend a few minutes of how you could distract a person and get them to think about themselves and what they're doing and what direction they're doing in their life and point them in a different direction. If you've got any ideas, please leave it in the comments. I've so enjoyed talking you, to you today and I want to do one more thing before I say goodbye and that is safety for children. In the home, it is best to, when your children are little, get down on the floor, lay down on the floor, sit on the floor, and look around to see what they could possibly get hurt on. Look around. Things that you don't see at your level, you might see at their eye level. So make sure you uh, look ahead and see what could possibly have become a problem. Something that they might head towards or do that could harm them. And one thing you can do in the kitchen is not leave the handles of your pots and pans that are, have hot things in them on the stove, hot or cold or empty. Do not leave the handles sticking out. A child can reach up and pull that pot or pan on themselves. Always turn those handles away. Now we used to get, uh, back in the 1950s, we had little brochures that came with our pots and pans or our oven that would say, you know, safety around children. I don't know if they're still doing that. I'm sure you could probably find it on different websites to do a study of how you can keep your children safe. One thing you can do is not keep any kind of chemicals, bleach, um, detergents, anything in the low cabinet under the sink or under the in the bathroom under the sink. Get all that out, put it up high. I only keep vinegar down there. I don't even have the chemicals anymore because I clean with cleaning vinegar, which is healthy for everyone, makes us breathe more easily, and also we don't have the you know, allergies and itching and, and runny eyes and runny noses and that sort of thing. So just safety with chemicals is so important. And uh, I mean, they can get a bottle of bleach and just sitting there, a little toddler can pull it out by the handle and he'll he can work the lid off. He, he actually can work the lid off and then dump it all out, get it all over everything. And so be careful, please, especially with essential oils. Don't let children have get anywhere near essential oils. If they get them in their eyes, they are very, very painful. And many other things. Go through everything. Go through your house and look. Uh, children like to get under things. Get under tables, get under chairs, whatever. Look under all of this stuff and 
create a, a home that is safe. So maybe they won't do that. But in case they do, there's nothing under there like a plug or something that they could hurt themselves on. Also be careful about things hanging. Now right behind me you see I've done my mantle with a little cloth here. But if it's hanging real low, a child can pull it and pull everything off. Same with a tablecloth. Um, when my children were little, we didn't use tablecloths because it was too, e or placemats even, it's too easy for them to pull those off. So those are just a few more things. If you've got any more questions about it, this wasn't an answer to a question. If you have any more questions about it, please let me know. And ladies, my time is running out. I said I would stay here for an hour. It's been 55 minutes. I can't think of anything else right now. But uh, to, to remember about your thinking that is your, and I've told you this in previous videos, this is the most essential part. I cannot tell you how much you can hurt yourself even if, if you have any of that stinking thinking where you're not going to do anything till life changes or till the world changes or, or till the U.S. Um, creates uh, world peace for everyone, um, you can depress yourself. And if you ever compare your blood pressure, your heart rate, your digestion, your elimination on days when you feel depressed to days that you feel happy, you'll find that that, that kind of thinking Stinking thinking ruins your health. It can ruin you. And many people are negative constantly because they have trained themselves to think that way, just to think the worst of everything and not to think the best of everything. And it's all up to you. Real healthy people don't wait for circumstances around them to improve before they decide to do something positive. And they don't, first of all, we've got to lose our dependence on other people's opinions. Now you probably have realized that on the web early earlier on when we first started doing these these blogs and message boards and different things like that, we'd find that people were extremely critical. And so we'll stop. People would stop and they just completely quit because they couldn't uh, they couldn't handle it. And this is the same that goes on in your home. If you want to make your home a success, you cannot let anybody else's opinion run you. And if you're happy the way you are and, and you, are, you, you lose your dependence on what other people say, you'll be a whole lot better. And in fact, I would suggest, since I mentioned the constitutions of each state, that you write a constitution. You write a constitution of how you would like it to be in your home and, and the attitudes that you would like to have permeate your home and uh, mentioned your love for the Lord and your love for your country, your love for your home. And whereas you believe all these things, you've determined to make your home a beautiful place. This was what something that was done in the home interiors parties that we used to go to where someone was trying to show you how to make a wall arrangement and sell you some pictures to go on your walls. And, and her, her uh, ambition was to beautify the homes of America. And she had a, a saying that uh, she that, that was her goal was so that everyone would have a happy home. And of course, we realize these things don't make a happy home, but they are reflections and, and they have an influence on us. So ladies, for next time, I hope you will send me some ideas and some questions and hopefully I can answer them. And I've really enjoyed being with you. Please leave a comment. And those of you who make your sweet sacrificial donations, I really appreciate it. They help so much. And it, it motivates me too. So I just want to thank you for giving me those little rewards now and then. And um, also, I hope that you got something done. So when you leave a comment, please tell me what you did while... Um, while you were listening. And I will try to leave you some more uh, interesting things that have gone on here, some things that Mr. S has done and said too that you might find rather interesting. And, and I hope to see you again. So if you have not, if you are only subscribed to the videos on YouTube, you won't be getting my blog. And my blog has posts on it that are not videos. So if you've subscribed to my blog, you will also get the other posts. Please go down the blog roll and get acquainted with my friends and see what all the other homemakers are doing. And I hope you have a wonderful day. Don't forget to make your list to create, uh, to take care of your appearance 
and to um, start your day with prayer. So uh, God bless you all, and thanks for coming, and we'll see you next time. Bye.